a hardworking New Mexico family. My dad was up at four in the morning, wouldn't go down till 10 o'clock at night. She was always the type of person to just help everybody. Is murdered on Father's Day. My parents are dead. They were covered in so much blood. That was the worst I've ever seen. Police uncover a loving family. He was a shaken baby. We were told he may never walk again. With a startling criminal connection. She has a history of burglaries. And a jaw-dropping revelation. I absolutely was shocked. I didn't think I have ever known anybody in my life who could do something that brutal. To this day, I still can't understand how the person could do something this tragic, this gruesome. They said, I know who did it. I know who did it. El Rancho a tiny New Mexico town home to just a few hundred families, a place filled with honest, hardworking people. It's a very tight-knit community. It's kind of one of those places where everybody knows everybody. On Father's Day 2011, police receive a 911 call that shatters the early evening calm. Santa Fe 911, where's your emergency? Santa Fe, help! Help me! Santa Fe, help! The caller is a 35-year-old woman named Cherie Ortiz Rios. Officers arrive at the property she shares with her parents, Lloyd and Dixie Ortiz. Police enter the home occupied by Cherie's parents and her brother to investigate, starting with the master bedroom. I had observed a female laying face down in her nightgown attire, deceased. The brutality that was involved was unspeakable. She had some trauma on the right side of her temple region. Police believe this is Cherie's 53-year-old mother, Dixie Ortiz. As you walk out through the main door to the bedroom, there's a couple of steps up into a kitchen. That's where a deceased male was laying face down. That was probably the worst I've ever seen. There was several defects in his head and shoulder area. Cherie tells police that this is the body of her 21-year-old brother, Stephen. As you walk back out the room to the rear of the residence, there was another deceased male laying face down. And he had several injuries to his upper torso and his head region. The dead man is Cherie's 58-year-old father, Lloyd. Detectives call in the medical examiner to take charge of the bodies. For now, they can only speculate about the cause and time of death. There were limitations on how well we could examine the injuries because they were covered in so much blood. It looked like something that had penetrated all of their bodies. So at that point, it led us to believe that they were actually shot with some type of a firearm. While the medical examiner carefully removes the bodies, a forensics team meticulously looks for evidence. We did not find any shell casings. There wasn't a gun located. There was nothing that indicated that we had our murder weapon at the scene. We have no physical evidence as far as some type of a fingerprint. There weren't any footwear impressions in any of the blood. Maybe we can get some DNA, but we don't know that initially that has to be sent to the lab for testing. With this type of crime scene, generally there is only a couple different types of motive. It's love, money, or anger. So we have to look into those. Lloyd's wallet was on the counter right next to where Stephen was lying in the kitchen. It had money in it. It didn't look like somebody was in there to steal from them. There's no evidence to suggest this is a robbery. So police consider whether other motives could have been at play. Who would stand to gain something from killing three people on Father's Day in their house? Police need to learn more about the victims and their family. They turn to Cherie, who lives just steps away. On the two-thirds of the property, Lloyd Dixie and their son, Stephen, lived. 
and the other third was occupied by Lloyd and Dixie's daughter, Cherie, her husband, Jesse, and their two children, Catalina and Robert. When her sister arrives, a despondent Cherie can barely keep it together. I remember my sister running up to me and telling me, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that my mom and my dad and my brother were dead. There were no, nothing I could do or say to make it better for her. I love my sister so much, so much. Cherie and Angela choke back tears as they tell police all about the most important people in their lives. My mom and dad were the best parents that I could ever ask for. They were always there, always accepted us for who we were, always stood by our side, no matter what. Lloyd was a tile contractor who was popular in the town. My dad was amazing. Up at four in the morning, wouldn't go down till probably 10 o'clock at night every day. Lloyd had been married to Dixie for 34 years. She worked in a nursing home. She didn't even think of that as being a job. It was just who she was. Dixie's selfless, caring manner didn't stop with her work. In 1989, when their daughters were just teens, she and Lloyd took in a baby in need. Stephen was seven months old when he came into our home as a foster child. He was a shaken baby. His left side of the body was paralyzed. He had cerebral palsy. We were told that he may never walk, talk. I would grab him out of the crib and stick him right next to me in bed, and he would sleep right next to me. I just loved him so much. As he grew, the family's love helped transform Stephen into a strong and happy little boy. Walking, potty training, the developmental milestones, they took a lot longer for him to reach, but he reached every single one of them. Stephen was part of our church, and he was such an absolute joy. He would greet everybody. Everybody in church loved him. He, he made it a point to talk to everybody. He was quite a young man. Stephen, Lloyd, and Dixie's lives have been cut tragically short. But why would someone murder such a loving family? Police find one possible reason growing outside. There were several marijuana plants that were being grown. There was a fenced off area where there were 17 plants growing. These plants were not visible unless you were directly over them. It was a very tight boxed in area that was padlocked. A marijuana crop under lock and key outside the family home piqued detectives' interest. Had they just uncovered an illegal drug operation? My parents had a medical marijuana card for my brother and a grower's license. So they were legally growing medical marijuana for my brother. My brother had two brain surgeries to relieve some of the pressure in his brain. And so they prescribed medical marijuana to him to help relieve the headaches he was having. They were pretty debilitating at times. The family had known that Lloyd was growing the marijuana for Stephen and the family would smoke some of the marijuana. While the marijuana was being grown legally, detectives suspect that it could have attracted the attention of the wrong people. Was this some type of a drug-related incident? Police become even more concerned when Cherie and her husband, Jesse, relay a story about a few suspicious characters they heard outside their home on the night of the murder. They indicated that they were watching a movie that ended between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Their dog started barking, and Jesse got up and walked to the front window. He saw a car that was parked outside. He heard a kid yelling out there. He heard somebody say, hurry up, come on. And he was like, there's somebody out there. And so he went back in and even grabbed a gun. And he got in his truck, and he drove his truck toward that car. Coming up. The autopsy reveals an unexpected cause of death. It's not generally your weapon of choice. It's extremely violent, it's brutal. And the town is stunned when the killer is revealed. People were in disbelief. 
As a pastor, it was hard for me to even fathom. Hours after Lloyd, Dixie, and Stephen Ortiz are found dead, police are hunting for the driver of a car seen outside the home the night before the murders. We interviewed Lloyd and Dixie's daughter, Cherie, and she said that her husband, Jesse, saw a car that was parked outside and to the left of the property. He had indicated that the vehicle was a gray car. The dog started barking crazy. My husband, Jesse, he came out and even got in his truck. Cherie tells police Jesse followed the vehicle in his truck. But when detectives interview Jesse, he tells them a completely different story. In Jesse's interview, he had failed to mention that he actually left the house that evening. You never left the house? No. Why would your wife say you left the house? That I left the house. Why would she say that? Maybe because I was outside or something. She said she heard you leave the house. Why would she say that? I don't know. It was pretty concerning that he would forget one of the biggest details of that evening with his involvement. As detectives continue to press Jesse, he suddenly remembers details from the night before. Jesse. Hey, you know what? I might have been at the house when I seen the car parked. You know what? That is correct. That is correct. You see the issue? Yeah, I do. I forgot about that. It's something you don't just yeah. forget about, Jesse. Well, I'm serious, man. Man to man. You know where I'm going. Right. It's time to start talking. I did. I did. I do remember, because I remember going back down there to get my keys. And I did get in my truck. And I drove towards the dead end that way. What happened then? I passed by. I passed by. Why would you not confront somebody right there? Because I didn't expect anything. Jesse, you're lying to me, dude. I'm not lying to you, bro. I'm telling you the truth. Jesse's changing story now has police eyeing him as a suspect. And when they ask him about his relationship with his in-laws, they think they may have hit upon a motive. We found out something very alarming. There was some stuff in the close past that had caused some family tension between Lloyd and Jesse. And we knew at one point Lloyd was embarrassed of the way that Cherie and Jesse's property looked, so he actually built a fence in between the two properties so he didn't have to look at it anymore. So we knew there was some tension there. Police can't rule out that tension in the family could have boiled over. Could Jesse have slipped out of the house and committed three heinous murders over a minor family squabble? To get to the truth, police grilled a couple about where they were the night of the murder. They told us the timeline of where they were. They went to a casino. They were there for X amount of time, drove to their residence. They put in a movie right away. They were able to identify almost minute for minute of what they did that entire day, which is kind of unusual. And when police ask Cherie about finding the bodies, she tearfully gives them a detailed account of the horror that unfolded. And I walked in and I was like, Mom, and then I walked over to her to shake her, and her head was blown. And so I ran to the kitchen to check for my brother and my dad, and I thought it was my dad laying on the floor in his underwear because his face was so blown off. And so I ran home screaming, screaming for my husband. And my husband went back and he said, honey, that's Steven in the kitchen. Your dad's dead in the backyard. Cherie's story is plausible, but one thing she can't explain is something she told police when she called 911. Cherie said that she knew if she would have went over there, she could have saved him that morning, which told me that she had intimate knowledge of when the, the homicides actually occurred, which pretty concerning. How would she know that? We didn't know that timeline of when they were actually killed. Detectives are no longer suspicious of just Jesse. 
Is it possible that the Ortiz's own daughter could be involved as well? We did obtain DNA samples from Sherry and Jesse to try and analyze to see if there was anything that could be mashed. Police searched Cherie and Jesse's home, hoping to find a physical link to the murder. With so much activity in the tiny town of El Rancho, news of the crime spreads. My wife and I raced down to the property. When we had got there, there was quite a few people there. Tree was just outside herself. She was just hysterical. Detectives can't help but wonder if Cherie's tears are genuine yet they're unable to find any physical evidence to link Cherie or Jesse to the murders. When the autopsy report comes back the next day, they hope the results will help them shed some light on the mystery. I actually did attend the autopsy, and during the course of the autopsy, the pathologist informed us that the wounds sustained were the result of impact trauma. They were killed with a pickaxe. Steven Ortiz, the son of Lloyd and Dixie, received 17 blows to the head from the pickaxe. Evidently, the victims were beaten long after they were already deceased. The amount of force that was used to cause this was extreme. My initial reaction was, who had this much anger to want to kill him in such a gruesome, gruesome manner? After receiving the autopsy report on a horrific triple homicide in El Rancho, New Mexico, detectives have just discovered that the Ortiz family was killed with a pickaxe. Now that police know what to look for, they quickly set out to find the murder weapon. One of the agents remembers seeing a Maddox-style pickaxe lying in an adjacent field to the west of the residence. So we immediately went to the scene and found our pickaxe covered in blood processed it to the crime scene lab in Santa Fe and waited for results. There was a lot of hope that there was going to be potential evidence that would link the assailant to the pickaxe. There was nothing. There was nothing there. We got DNA that was identified on the pickaxe from the three victims. Nobody else. Still, the murder weapon does tell police something about the killer. It would take a great deal of force to cause that type of injury. Police had to consider whether either of their suspects were strong enough to commit the crime. Jesse was capable. Was Cherie? While police search for answers, the small town of El Rancho is gripped with fear. The whole community was on high alert. This kind of crime is very unusual for that area. All we knew was that there were three dead people, people that the community loved, and nobody knew why and how. Police continue to look into the alibis of the main suspects, Cherie Ortiz and her husband, Jesse Rios, who said they'd been to a casino that night. Investigators see if their story can be verified. They were seen on surveillance video at a gas station, and then they went to a casino. This supports the couple's claims. Investigators also track what they did the rest of the evening. We were able to pinpoint the length of time that it would take to drive from the casino to their house. The timeline puts them in their home, right next door to the murders, at the time of the crime. But it's not nearly enough evidence to pursue a case. Police hope to utilize the publicity surrounding the murders and make an appeal for tips. Everybody wanted to say who they thought it was, but didn't have any merit behind any of the stuff they were coming forward with. Detectives also combed through their witness interviews and hit on a name they hadn't considered before. Initially, Angela had mentioned that Nicholas Ortiz was a 16-year-old, just a regular kid in the community. Cherie had a son that was Nicholas's age, and they went to school together. Nick Ortiz had a 
positive relationship with the family. There's no relation, by the way, between Nick Ortiz and the, the three Ortizes who, who were victim. It's just same last name. Nicholas's family lived right up the road from us, and that's how him and my son had become friends. He was having some troubles at home. Eventually, my sister opened up her home to him, gave him his own room. He would go over next door to Lloyd and Dixie's house. They would give him money. They took him to the flea market. They took him everywhere. So they basically just treated him like he was one of the family. But the transition to family member wasn't all smooth. My husband and I had caught Nicholas going through our drawers. We had just started noticing um, a little bit of money missing. Things moved. So we started giving him an allowance every week for the chores he was doing as well. Nick's troubles extended to school, too. Nick had come home from school, and he was, you could tell he had been punched in the face and was kind of beat up. I freaked out, oh my god, who did this to you? He said, I joined a gang with some friends of mine, and I had to let them beat me up. And I was like, OK, so now today we're going to have the anti-gang talk. And I mean, we did. The family tells police that joining a gang was just one example of the problems Nick brought to their home. One night, my father had asked my son to cut down a, a plum tree that was dead in his backyard. And when they went out there, Nick was hiding behind some raised flower beds they had in their backyard. And the backyard was a secured area for the two little dogs they had, so both gates were locked from the inside. So he had to have jumped the fence to get back there. Nick basically jumped up and kind of rawr, went towards him, joking in a joking manner, like to scare him. And Lloyd wasn't impressed by it. He didn't think it was funny. After stealing from the family and joining a gang, this was the final straw for Lloyd. He basically told Nick that he was not welcome at that property ever again. It made us feel on guard and very uncomfortable, and we think it's best that it's time for him to move back home. I then text Nicholas and told him that he could come and pick up all the clothing and furniture that we had purchased for him over that time period, and he could take it home with him. I never really saw him again after that. Could the Ortiz's rejection of Nicholas lead him to kill? Had he murdered Lloyd, Dixie, and Stephen in cold-blooded revenge? The police bring in Nick for questioning. Do you know anything about this case that could help us? Police in El Rancho, New Mexico, have a new suspect in the murders of Lloyd, Dixie, and Stephen Ortiz, an unrelated 16-year-old named Nicholas Ortiz. Detectives ask where he was the night of the murder. He said he was at home with his dad and sisters leading up to Father's Day. Between 12 and 1 o'clock, he woke his father up and wished him a happy Father's Day and went back to bed. And he was there when his mom got off of work, which was around 7, 7.30 in the morning. Everything was corroborated as far as his alibi. Not only does Nicholas have a solid alibi, his demeanor in the interview doesn't suggest he is the killer. Do you think if you found out who did that, if I found out who did it, I would call the police right away? Police find people in the community who vouch for Nick. 
Nicholas was part of our congregation. He was very, very gentleman-like. He was kind. He was willing to help. He would stay late sometimes and help us pick up after the church. Police crossed Nicholas Ortiz off the suspect list. Then, two days after the murder, they get an urgent call from Cherie Ortiz. I called the police and I told them we found out about a safe that was um, well hidden, enough where my sister and I didn't even know it existed. At my parents' house, my uncle Walter had called me and said, I built your dad a secret piece of furniture that would hide a safe in it. The unit was so well concealed, the police had not found it when they searched the house days earlier. I said, I do not want to know anymore until we contact the police. So we had to have it opened up there at the police station. Inside was $80,000 in cash, as well as some of the life insurance paperwork. That's when we found that my dad had been saving money for years. He had his retirement saved in there. Cherie says she didn't know about the money, but police make a discovery that puts her claim in doubt. We had learned through district court that the power of attorney had been given to Cherie at this point. And she was basically gonna be the heir of hundreds of thousands of dollars in life insurance policies that Lloyd and Dixie had. And that $80,000 that was in the safe was part of a cash out from those life insurance policies. Cherie says she didn't know about the insurance policy. The inheritance was large enough to give Cherie and Jesse a powerful motive for murder. But motive alone wasn't enough to arrest either one of them. We have no physical evidence that could tie Cherie and Jesse to the crime. The discovery of the safe also causes police to speculate on how the Ortizes had amassed so much money. Could it have anything to do with the marijuana growing on the property? Kind of raised some concern to us as to why he was growing it. Are they possibly selling this stuff? Detectives investigate whether Lloyd was secretly involved in trafficking. The answer comes back clear. Nothing was taken from this house. It didn't even appear that whoever was there at the time knew that there was pot plants being grown behind this fence. And knowing anything about the, the industry of marijuana, there were smaller plants, they weren't mature. We were able to pretty much rule out that the gangs were tied in to this. It's another blow for the investigation. And as days turn to weeks, detectives are no closer to catching those responsible. Essentially, you do run out of leads or you run into dead ends. As frustrating as it was for us as investigators, it had to have been exponentially worse for the family. I was on the phone with the police every single day asking, what have they heard? Anything new? What can I do to help? And we were always told, nothing. There's nothing you can do. I truly felt like they were not ever going to solve this case. Then, 16 months after the murders, detectives get the break they've been praying for when they receive a call from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. In October of 2012, I had just gotten home from work, and I got a call that there's somebody there that wants to give some information to me in reference to the homicide. And she was in jail. She said she just wants to get something off her chest. Detectives are hopeful a new tip will finally help solve the murders of Lloyd, Dixie, and Stephen Ortiz. The information comes from a young woman in the custody of Santa Fe police. Ashroy Ball was 24, and she has a history of burglaries and, and of drug use. Ashley told officers that she knew something about the El Rancho murders. At that point, ears started to perk within law enforcement. Before questioning Ashley, police look into her background. Ashley grew up in El Rancho. Ashley wasn't necessarily a troubled teen, per se. 
but she got in trouble a lot. <laughs> From a young age, was in and out of the detention center. Lead detective Craig Bobnock questions Ashley about what she knows. As I started explaining that it was a voluntary interview, she kept interrupting me saying, I know who did it, I know who did it. Ashley claims that on the night of the murder, she was smoking weed with her cousin, Jose Roybal, and a mutual friend. They needed money, so they were gonna go hit the Ortiz's house. And I took them, I dropped them off, and I went back home. She told me that she owned a gray 1997 Saturn car, two-door car, during the time of the homicide. So I immediately thought of Jesse's statement. Cherie Ortiz's husband, Jesse Rios, had told police he saw a gray car driving slowly past their house late on the night of the murder. But it's what Ashley says next that grabs detectives' attention. Mm, I got a call about maybe half an hour, 45 minutes later. The call was from Jose's friend, and he needed a ride. He got in my car, he was, he had blood on his pants, he had a trash bag tied around his right foot. That's when he told me that he killed Stephen Dixie and Lloyd. Um, he said he threw the pickaxe by the fence. He kept saying they killed him, he messed up, they killed him. Ashley told me that the single person that killed the Ortiz family was Nick Ortiz. Ashley's revelation is explosive. This family took in Nick when he was having trouble at home. He stayed there for upwards of a couple of months in which he got very close with the family. He would eat there, he would get off the school bus there. It was basically his home, they took him in. But police need to be sure Ashley's telling the truth. After all, she has a rap sheet, and their suspect has an alibi. The information that Ashley Royball provided had to have come from somebody who was actually there during the incident. Ashley explains another detail that puts her at the scene. Do they wear gloves? Do they care about fingerprints? Who's that? He had a sock on his hand. He did have a sock on his hand? Mm-hmm. Police are hopeful they can find evidence in Ashley's car, but it's nowhere to be found. It's 18 months later. She had said she had sold it to a tow company. The vehicle ultimately ended up at the shredder. Couldn't find it. Investigators had to find another way to verify her story. I received a lot of the phone logs, and that was my big piece of evidence at this point. Cell phone records show the communication between Nicholas, Ashley, and her cousin, Jose, peaked around the time of the murders. So investigators immediately bring Nick back in to confront him with the evidence. So I brought Nick in. He's in 100% denial of everything until I bring up the phone records. I'm just gonna show you, dude, these, are, these are your texts between you and Jose. You're, you're the orange and he's the white. That's how much you guys texted on Saturday night into Sunday morning. Is it surprising? Um, well, um, with all, all due respect to you guys and all that, I'd really like to just stop talking and go home. Okay. I want another chance at another interview with him, so I didn't want to ruin it. So we ended the interview. Investigator's next move is to haul in Jose for questioning. Since he's a minor, they get permission from his parents to speak to him. He was 15 at the time. He drank a lot. He had problems at home. He didn't have a good reputation. Police talk to Jose, and he opens up. Ashley dropped me and Nick off so to go rub the house. She left. Nick told me he would go in. He wanted me to go in with him to go kill him. And I told him no. I didn't want to. I was scared. He started walking towards the house. When he started walking towards the house, I ran to the river, I got to my house, and then Ashley and Nick show up. Nick is white as a ghost. I knew he had did it. He told me he had did it, he told me he did it. 
Jose's story matches Ashley's, and suddenly police have two witnesses against Nicholas. On February 12th, 2015, I got the approval from the district attorney to get an arrest warrant for Nick Ortiz. District court judge signed it and said, go pick him up. Just like before, Nicholas remains uncooperative. So I brought him in a copy of the criminal complaint. There were five total charges on the criminal complaint that I gave him. He said, I don't agree with two of these charges on here. And there were only two charges that were different from murder. So it's an admission to me. I knew I had him at that point. It was, it was him. With Nicholas taken into custody, detectives finally have some news for the Ortiz family. I absolutely was shocked when the police said he had done this. I didn't think I have ever known anybody in my life who could do something like that, that brutal. I've never, I've never met anybody that could hurt people so grossly. It didn't make sense because that was not at all his personality when he lived with us. People were in disbelief. As a pastor, I, it was hard for me to even fathom the fact that a young man like this could do something so tragic. This gruesome. On June 15th, 2015, Nicholas goes to trial for massacring the Ortiz family. Nick was a minor at the time. Given the fact that this was a heinous triple homicide, the judge did agree with my office that Nicholas should be charged as an adult. When the trial starts, the prosecution is confident of a conviction until an unexpected development jeopardizes the whole case. So in the middle of trial, we received a big surprise in Jose changing his testimony completely. Nicholas Ortiz alone stands accused of a savage triple murder. His two former friends are taking plea bargains to testify against him. But just as prosecutors think it's a cut and dry case, the unexpected happens. So in the middle of trial, we received a big surprise in Jose changing his testimony completely, pointing at Ashley as the individual who instructed them to kill the family. Originally, the plan was to rob the Ortiz family. But according to Jose, Ashley had something more sinister in mind. Jose Raybal testified that Ashley said, why don't you just kill them? It's a stunning statement, which the defense denies. The case agent said, well, she said she didn't say that. And then the lawyer said, yeah, but Jose Roybal says she did. So somebody must be lying. Jose testified that Ashley gave the two boys socks to cover up their hands and plastic bags with Kleenex in them to cover up their feet so that they wouldn't leave traces there. He also said that she is the one that handed Nick the weapon. According to Jose, in the early hours of June 19th, 2011, Ashley tells Nicholas and Jose it's time to put her unthinkable plan into action. Ashley takes Jose and Nick to the Ortiz house, drops them off, Jose got scared. He left. He ran home. Nick went towards the house. He knocks on the back door. Lloyd Ortiz gets up out of bed. When he opens it, he's attacked by Nicholas with the pickaxe. He didn't stop there. He went into the house and struck Dixie twice in her temple on the right side of her head with the pickaxe. Nicholas moved on to the kitchen, looking for the money, but he found Stephen instead. Recognizing who is in his house. Stephen puts up a fight. Nick delivers 17 blows to, to his head and body and kills him. After Nick killed the three Ortizes, he, he didn't take anything. He got scared, so he just left. 
he walked out the, the door and called Ashley. The revelations come as a shock to the victim's family. Every day that we were at that trial, it was devastating because we learned things, I learned things that I didn't know. And I wish I hadn't because it still haunts me. Nick doesn't say a thing during the entire trial. It's Jose's word against Ashley's. How would their competing testimonies affect the jury? The case was based almost entirely on Ashley and Jose's testimony, and that was an, a point of contention amongst people up until the sentencing. After three and a half days, I remember the jury went into the courtroom and uh, the foreperson said, we're just, no matter how much time you give us, we're just not gonna come to a consensus. So the judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial. It was horrible. It was devastating to me. I felt like our hearts had been ripped out. We had all this hope. Luckily, we have the opportunity to try them again, which we did. 17 months later, in December 2016, the case goes back to court. Luckily, this time around, we proved to all 12 jurors that Nicholas Ortiz was the individual that killed those three people. On October 28th, 2019, Nicholas is sentenced to 25 years in prison. The victory rings hollow for the victim's loved ones. What that felt like to me was each victim, my mom, my dad, and my brother, was only worth eight years each. That's exactly what that is. It's a joke. That's not justice. He's gonna do probably 12 to 15 years. No way. No way. Ashley Royball received a 20-year sentence. Six years of that was suspended, so 14 years of incarceration. Jose got full immunity for his testimony. He never got so much as probation. Even though years have passed since the murders, their effects remain. I would say I'm sorry to my parents and my brother. I'm sorry I wasn't there to help you. <laughs> so I would say I love you and I miss you and I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want them to be remembered through their compassion, their love for children, their love for life, how they lived for us as their daughters, for my brother, and to remind us each day that that's how we should live. For more information on an unexpected killer, go to oxygen.com. <laughs>